So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today we have assembled here uh, to discuss a uh, sort of a rare tumor, uh, salivary gland tumors, and uh, the adjuvant treatment for the salivary gland tumors. So we have Cecil sir with us. Uh, as we all know, uh, he's additional professor in head and neck oncology at RCC Trivandrum, and uh, he needs no introduction uh, to this forum. So thank you, sir, for giving us uh, this precious opportunity to learn from you and over to you sir thank you thank you, thank you very much for the invitation okay uh, i will share my slide uh, i hope you can see my slides yes sir it's okay okay thank you so today we will discuss about the management of salivary gland tumors so I will take you through um, the, from the clinical uh, clinical history taking to the till the adjuvant treatment. Uh, so they are very rare rare compared to this pharmacy customer of head and neck. And uh, we all know that the salivary gland. What is a salivary gland? Salivary gland salivary gland is any cell or organ discharging secretion into the oral cavity. They are divided into paired and unpaired. And this this paired is mainly the parotid gland, the submandibular gland, the minor cell, the sublingual gland. They are the paired, three, one, three. Then the minor salivary glands are present in oral cavity, paranasal sinuses, oropharynx, in various sites, this is uh, present. And uh, the most common uh, is the parotid. So this is the, the, you have the parotid, then you have the submandibular gland, the sublingual gland. The, Parotid is the most common uh, salivary gland tumor we are dealing with. So the, this uh, is parotid. If you look into the anatomy, you can see that the superiorly it is the zygomatic cast. This is the zygomatic cast. Inferiorly, it is at the level of the styloid process that you cannot see here. The anteriorly, the parotid gland and the duct. This is a duct. The anterior boundary is the anterior border of the masseter. And posteriorly, the mastoid process. So this is the boundary of the parotid. So superiorly, it is a zygomatic arch. Then you have anteriorly the clenched masseter. Posteriorly, the mastoid process. So the, and the sublingual, submandibular gland. Submandibular gland is present in the submandibular triangle. You can see the submandibular triangle. I will show that. You have a superficial lobe and a deep lobe. And the, it is this mylohyoid muscle is dividing the superficial and the deep lobe of the submandibular gland. And you have the sublingual gland that is behind, beneath the teeth, that is, sorry, beneath the tongue, that is seen in the sublingual space, the sublingual space, sublingual gland, along with the, along with the, along with the, the submandibular duct, the neurovascular bundle is seen in the sublingual space. The submandibular gland, okay, I, will, I will come to the submandibular gland. Uh, this, this is the submandibular, you know the submandibular triangle is bounded medially by the anterior belly of the digestive muscle. This is the anterior belly of the digestive muscle. And behind that, that is the, that is underneath that you see the mylohyoid muscle. And this is supposed to be belly of the digestive muscle. So this, this forms the submandibular triangle. And laterally it is bounded by the mandible. So this is the submandibular triangle, which contains the submandibular gland as well as the the uh, the sub, the uh, the, uh, the gland as well as the nose are seen in the submandibular gland. And this is the, you have the uh, superficial part of the submandibular gland and the deep lobe. This is formed by the mylohyoid muscle. So this is a mylohyoid muscle, and the submandibular gland duct opens in the sublingual space. This is a sublingual gland that is seen beneath the, uh, the so you can see that in the sublingual space. So that is the paired the, uh, salivary glands. And if you look into the malignancy wise, you can see that uh, most of the tumors, most of the, uh, the tumors in the parotid region are benign. Okay, you can see that one fifth, that is, a, sorry, for the, the 25%, one fourth is malignant, whereas 75% is benign. But if you look into the minor salivary gland, you can see that majority are malignant. Majority are malignant. 
and only small percentage is benign in minus elliptic gland. In the submandibular gland, it is more or less same, 57-45. So it's more or 50-50. That is, most more are uh, malignant, but uh, more or less there is a difference is much less compared to the parotid or parotid gland. So in if you have a parotid tumor, parotid swelling, uh, three fourths it is benign. Most of them are pleomorphic adenomas, slow growing tumor. So when you will suspect a malignancy, the, then if this patient, in a patient who is having a salivary gland for a long period, or a patient who have a salivary gland tumor, long period, which is having a short, a, a rapid increase in size, or a tumor which is having a short history, these are all malignant tumors. Uh, then clinically, you can see that there is no signs of inflammation. The acute, is, suppose most of, most of the time, it may be a parotiditis, parotid abscess. So there will be signs of Inflammation will be there. There will be tenderness present. And when you examine, you can make all the Then, in a malignant tumor, it, the borders will be ill defined, it will be hard in consistency, there will be a restriction of mobility, and fixity will be there. The involvement of the patient can have features of facial nerve damage, lymph node involvement. And this all make you think that we are dealing with a malignant parotid. So, a clinical examination shows a solid mass, then ill defined margin, fixed, it's a, in, in, uh, fixed, and skin infiltration is present, and facial nerve damage or in what nose. This all makes me think that you are dealing with a malignant parotid. And in such situations, you have to clearly, you have to proper clinical examination, history and proper clinical examination is required. You should have a diagnosis, working diagnosis. Am I dealing with a benign tumor? Or a malignant. Then you go for the uh, the investigations like epilepsy, ultrasound. If you have a dealing with a benign tumor, so you, you do if you do an ultrasound, it will give you some uh, uh, picture. It will say it will make you think that you are dealing with benign. Tumor. Okay, I will come to that. So and the next step is to have a FNS. FNS is having a very good sense specificity. Why you need to have an FNS? Okay, I will I will come to that. Uh, why you need an FNS? Then, if it is malignancy, then you should have an imaging. The imaging of choice in a parotid tumor is to have an MRI of the face and neck. Then, chest x ray is a, and a CT thorax is not routinely recommended. PET CT is not recommended. And routine uh, blood parameters. So, you need an FNAC imaging if it is malignant. Staging is more or less similar to that of a squamosal carcinoma of the head. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology 2011. It shows that the specificity, if you do an FNAC in, uh, in the diagnostic accuracy of FNAC for a parotid lesions, it is around, specificity is around 90, 97%. So how, why you need a FNAC? Okay, suppose if you have a benign tumor clinically, or you have a malignancy of the clinically, suppose if you're having a heart there's a mobility of restrictions there. You know that you are dealing with a malignancy. Okay, or if you have in a malignancy, definitely you need an FNAC. But in certain situations, in FNAC, if it is benign also, it will help you to uh, discuss with the patient. One, it is to differentiate between a neoplastic and a non-neoplastic condition. Second is benign versus malignant. So if it is malignant, definitely you can counsel the patient in such a way that, okay, if the, you may require a photo parotidectomy, then you can discuss that if it is a high grade, sometimes you can say that, okay, you need surgery, and then you need a plant post And if you have, and also to decide whether to have an elective neck resection, especially in high grade tumors or T3 or T4 disease. If an advanced disease or you have a uh, high grade tumor, then you can discuss the, the option of a selective neck resection. This is how FNAC is helpful. Uh, in deciding the further treatment. Now, coming to the in the imaging. So, if you have a, if you have it, suppose if the FNAC shows the mucoepidermal carcinoma, the grading cannot be done. Or if it is low grade mucoepidermal carcinoma or a high grade mucoepidermal carcinoma, which is the most common uh, salivary gland histology, then you need to have an imaging. Imaging, uh, the MRI is preferred over CT scan. MRI is helpful in, in majority of situations. CTs have an edge in a situation, certain situations that I will discuss. So if you have the, then, 
imaging is helpful in uncertain extent of disease so especially if you have uh, the uh, extent of disease whether deep lobe is involved any patient is having intraperitoneal intraperitoneal node is there patient is having a parapharyngeal space involvement is present whether patient is having a perineural invasion is present whether it is fixed to the masseter the under uh, what about the underlying the mandible and if the other the lesion is going into the base of skull this all can be delineated by an mri and uh, the parapharyngeal space location the facial nerve uh, then cervical lymph node involved then uh, the in, if you do an ultrasound we will discuss with an ultrasound so if you have a benign tumor clinically you have a long duration of history no clinical signs of malignancy and if any issues a pleomorphic adenoma then it is more or less then you need only an ultrasound you you may not need an mri because clinically you are dealing with a benign tumor and certain situations make you think that it is malignant in the ultrasound if the, if the tumor is having an ill defined porous heterogeneous enhancement so heterogeneous architecture means the patient is having solid and cystic areas or any areas of necrosis this makes you think that you are dealing with a malignant then vascularity is very important whether it is both hyper and hypervascular vascularization nodal involvement or extension to subcutaneous tissue or a skin this all makes you think that you are dealing with a malignancy in an ultrasound but are, there are certain limitations for ultrasound what are the limitations for an ultrasound limitations for the ultrasound are the limitations for the ultrasound are one in a patient who is having a deep extension suppose a patient is having extended a deep lobe is involved or the patient extending into parapharyngeal space then our perineural invasion bony involvement this cannot be better seen in a, a ultrasound that is how the ultrasound has limitations when we are dealing with the parotid then the how the so this is a mri scan this is very recently uh, presented to the clinic and a 23 year old gentleman who is who had history of a parotid swelling of three year duration but a very recent increase in you know, onset of increase in size clinically it was a uh, it was a form swelling on the right parotid region there is no restriction of movements it was not hard form to hard actually. and there is no restriction of movements there is no facial damage and borders were well defined and uh, patient had no clinical nodules and the fns you showed a uh, pleomorphic adenoma with malignant tumor that is expleomorphic adenoma then uh, they, we have done an mri with this g1 contrast showing axial plane shows is a lesion in the superficial lobe of the parotid the deep lobe is free and abutting the masseter but there is a plane it is an heterogeneous you can make out it's a heterogeneous enhancement so you have to make out you have to think that you are dealing with an malignancy with this if you have a homogeneous and intensely enhanced invasion then it is being a benign if it is heterogeneous disease the borders are well defined and then in the uh, so this is a t2 flare you can see that heterogeneous enhanced lesion the right lobe of the parotid and this is the left lobe of the parotid which is normal this is the left lobe of the parotid so it's sorry left parotid plan. and this is the uh, this is the right parotid it's mainly in the superficial lesion superficial lobe and it is the deep lobe is free and the parapharyngeal space is also free so this is a really, so you need an fnac it is mainly to take one it will give you so if it is malignant then definitely you can discuss according but even if it is benign but clinically if it is malignant always you should be prepared the surgeon should be prepared to do a mass surgery for a malignant parotid and the radiology will radiology features will give you a added clinical knowledge before considering surgery so mri have certain advantages ct scores in certain situations the perineural invasion is present suppose a lesion is going into Fetus affects like space of skull involvement, parapharyngeal space involvement, cranial nerve, and the lesions arising the deep lobe. And these all situations, in these situations, the MRI is more helpful than CT. And in, if you have a mandible is involved, suppose a patient is having a mandible involvement or a temporal bone is involved, then CT can is superior in in identifying the mandible involvement, temporal bone involvement. that is the uh, imaging so you need to have an imaging that is fnac and an imaging 
then X-ray chest. And suppose if your patient is having started nodes or the patient is having low cervical nodes, then you have to be, you need to have a TT thorax. Otherwise, X-ray chest is fine. And if after this, after the workup, then then the patient should undergo initial undergo surgery. That is the standard treatment for uh, parotid tumors because uh, the primary treatment is surgery. The types of surgeries when there is superficial parotidectomy, total conservative parotidectomy. Then third is the radical parotidectomy or total parotidectomy where there is a sacrifice of the facial nerve. And the last one is the extended radical parotidectomy that is beyond the total parotidectomy. And uh, this is a very good uh, uh, review article that is uh, that is published in 2017 in oral oncology by the uh, from group from Italy. This is surgical treatment of salivary gland tumor. It's a very good uh, article. And uh, this uh, superficial parotidectomy means they remove the gland superficial to the plane of the facial nerve. So you remove the tumor which is above the plane of the facial nerve. And it's a treatment of choice for mainly for benign tumors and also a tumors, mainly the benign, mainly the low grade tumors involving the superficial lobe, which is not having a deep lobe involvement. But in high grade tumors, generally a total conservative parodectomy is the accepted. Total conservative parodectomy is considered for tumors which are extending into deep lobe or tumors which is arising to the deep lobe. Then a total conservative parodectomy. Total conservative parotectomy means the entire parotid gland with the intraparotid nodes are removed, but the facial nerve is retained. That is total conservative parotectomy. And the high grade tumors, suppose a patient is with a high grade tumor, and if a patient had a parotid malignancy with nodal density or a tumor, the patient had undergone surgery outside and superficial parotectomy was done, and the margin is positive. And in all these situations, total conservative product in a high grade tumor, irrespective generally, or a tumor involving the deep lobe, especially T3, 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 T4 disease, patients who have pre previously undergone a superficial product and margin is positive, then patient, any patient with a lymph node metastasis, in all these situations, then total conservative product is done. And the main aim is to remove the, 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 remove the parotid. parotid in end block removal and preserving the facial. And when we discuss about the facial nerve, suppose if a patient is presenting with a facial nerve involvement, then if the, there is no facial nerve involvement is not there, then, then facial nerve sacrifice is not routinely undertaken. Means you should take all steps to preserve the facial nerve. The facial preservation, if there is, is nerve is functioning properly. Every attempt to dissect the tumor from the individual branches. So I will show the branches. If the if it is not possible, if it is encasing the branches, the neural sac neural sacrifice should be limited to the involved branches, not the entire patient now. Okay. So you have the uh, temporal branch. Okay, this is the temporal branch. Then you have the psychomatic branch. You have the buccal branch. The buccal branch the marginal mandibular branch and the cervical branch. Cervical branch is supplies the implant. So all this, you can, you need to understand that whether if the, if the, if the branches are enclosed, then you try to sacrifice the branch. Then if the multiple branches are involved or it is present, or then the, the, the main trunk is involved, then you may not be able to, uh, and it is involved by the tumor, then you may not be able to preserve the patient. So radical parotectomy is a removal of the whole of the parotid and then you sacrifice a facial nerve. That is beyond the total conservative parotectomy or means the total parotectomy. Then if you do a surgery, which is beyond the removal of the entire parotid plus facial nerve, that is called extended radical parotectomy. Then whole of the... The whole, the whole of the... The whole of the parotid gland, facial nerve, plus any of the above. Suppose a patient is having a band is involved or a temporal bone is involved or clinically the skin is present. That is a T4 at preservation, either by skin involvement, mandible involvement or a temporal bone involvement. Then you need to sacrifice that. So then you remove any of skin is removed. Then it is called external radical parotid. 
otherwise it is called a suppose so the superficial parotectomy it can be done even in malignant tumors but generally it is done only in the tumors which is confined to superficial lobe that to a low grade tumor. in a high grade tumor generally or a tumors involving the deep lobe or tumors arising the deep lobe or a high grade tumor generally total conservative parotectomy is done then beyond that then you try to sacrifice and the branches of the facial nerve if it is not possible then you sacrifice a facial nerve then other thing is extend a radical product suppose if you want to do a surgery which is involving the skin the mandible or temporal lobe then it is called extended radical parotectomy the same is the principle with submandibular gland and also the sublingual gland the submandibular gland is the complete excision of the gland if it is confined to the max the uh, capsule and in certain situations you may require a more, more extensive resection in submandibular gland carcinoma in suppose if a patient is having in that such situations the adjacent muscles a part of the mandible or floor of the mouth suppose a lesion is a, extending beyond the capsule of the submandibular gland then you may have to remove the adjacent muscles the lingual nerve and the part of the mandible or floor of the mouth the minor salivary gland tumors the the principle the sublingual also they follow the same principle minor salivary gland tumor suppose say you have a minor salivary gland at the junction of the hard palate and soft palate then the surgical treatment depend on the site of treatment the principle similar to squamous cell carcinoma arising in the primary site you don't have to do a neck dissection prophylactically that i will discuss later now coming to the management of neck if the nodes are present then you have to do a modified radical neck dissection level 1 to level 5 clearance if the nodes are not present clinically now like the clinically significant nodes are they not there then in a selective neck dissection is optional in patients who have high grade histology or advanced primary like ethio you cannot categorically say that this patient should undergo a elective neck dissection but a part of the a, a level 2 will be dissected to have an in block removal of the parotid gland so there otherwise you cannot categorically say that it is mandatory to have an elective neck dissection in patients who have n0 in patients who have n plus neck the neck dissection is mandatory otherwise in patients who have high grade histology T3 or T4 disease, the the selective neck dissection is two, three, and four is option. Now coming to the uh, the after the surgery, always we need a detailed HPR to decide the actual. Where is the primary site? Where is the laterality, histological type, the size, the histological grade, the marginal status, whether the perineural invasion is present, the lymphovascular involvement is present. then uh, the lymph nodes where what are which all the lymph nodes regions are involved any extra capsular extension is possible then most of the time the staging is more or less similar to the squamous cell carcinoma size criteria so less than 2 cm pt1 n1 sorry pt1 then 2 to 4 cm pt2 more than 4 cm pt3 now coming to the adjuvant treatment so you you have evaluated the tumor then you decided whether it is benign or malignant if it is malignant then you have done an imaging then after imaging then you have done a proper surgery then after surgery you have a proper histopathology report for deciding adjuvant the adjuvant treatment is required in advanced stage disease it's a planned treatment suppose a patient is fnac shows the mucoepidermal carcinoma high grade or fnac shows adenoid cystic carcinoma or a patient is having a adeno carcinoma or a patient is having an undifferentiated in high grade tumors in generally the is a plan treatment so you subject the patient for surgery and after surgery irrespective of the tumor size the patient require post operative radiotherapy so i have i have given this in different in a table in in 1990s and in early to 2000 these are the papers which has published the evaluating the role of adjuvant radiotherapy most of the data is retrospective or single institutional or multi institutional uh may or see a database or national cancer database and most of them this is one of the paper which published in 1990 from the armstrong et al that is from the mskcc this was a, a match pair analysis in patients who received surgery and surgery followed by post operative radiotherapy 
doctors found that there is a 10% improvement in survival with a significant p value and this paper is from the that i will discuss this paper is from netherlands and it has also is published in 2005 the surgery alone or surgery followed by post operative radiotherapy and there was a 10 year low original control with a statistically significant p value and this was not showing an improvement in survival okay i will discuss few this is a first paper which i discussed that is the mskcc data which published in 1990 and this is whether was the survival benefit in patients who received radiotherapy for advanced stage as well as non positive disease and this is both were statistically significant the overall survival five year overall survival benefit was there and if you look into the the other paper that is by the netherlands group that is published in one journal in 2005 in post operative radiotherapy the 10 year low original control was better in patients who received the radiotherapy for t3 t4 disease margin flows incomplete resection bone invasion perineal invasion but this, there was no survival benefit okay that was the paper published in red journal in 2005 this is a tehanka group this is published in 2011 almost 800 patients 871 patients the they have evaluated the patients who received radiotherapy between 1990 and 2005 it is found that in 871 patients those patients who received post operative radiotherapy there was a statistically significant 10 year low original control in in patients who had t3 t4 disease margin flows incomplete resection bone invasion perineal invasion or not possible so in all this situation They like margin positive, T3, T4, and bone invasion, perineal invasion. All these patients had a bent tenure low coronary control, and this was quite statistically significant. This is a database which was published in uh, 2011. In uh, it has found that those patients who had those patients who had received this is uh, published in the uh, uh, otolaryngology and neck surgery in 2011. and uh, in, it is included uh, patients treated with adjuvant radiotherapy between 1998 and 2005 number of patients included in the study more than 2000 patients in those patients who received radiation for high grade or locally advanced disease it was found that in all patients together all patients together the p value in terms of survival is 0.76 and this mortality the, there is a reduction in mortality in patients who received adjuvant radiotherapy and this is more pronounced in any grade any high grade in high grade tumors and patients who have advanced disease. so patients who had advanced disease like t3 t4 patients who had high grade tumors there there all this p value was sorry hazard ratio was 0.65 for high grade tumors and it is 0.77 uh, in any ad locally advanced disease. and patients who had both high grade and locally advanced the the hazard ratio was 0.63 so all patients put together the hazard ratio of death was 0.76 and this was quite statistically and if you look into the uh, the survival benefit for adjuvant radiotherapy in minor salivary gland so minor salivary gland tumors if those patients who received adjuvant radiotherapy again from ca database patients treated between 1988 2008 so it was 20 year period the number of patients were more than 2200 and the maximum benefit was seen in high advanced stage and high grade tumors and patients who were uh, nasopharynx location the adjuvant radiotherapy in there were the adjuvant radiotherapy the p value is 0.42 and this is in terms of overall survival and there is a minor salivary gland tumor there is a survival benefit. and coming to the last paper which i want to discuss is adjuvant radiotherapy for salivary gland tumors improved survival in patients of extra capsular extension or margin positive disease and this is a national cancer database which was published in advances in radiation oncology in 2017 showed that there is a hazard ratio of death was 0.76 point sorry 0.786 in patients who have extra capsular extension or margin positive disease. that that is a high risk patient and in the uh, this analysis they have divided patients were stratified into the high risk intermediate risk and low risk that is the high risk patients were extra capsular extension and positive marker and patients who had 
T3, T4, N plus adenoid cystic carcinoma, LBSI or high grade, they were considered as intermediate. This is, uh, there's, again, there is a gray area. This, do we need to have adjuvant radiotherapy for intermediate grade carcinoma? Low grade T1, T2, you do not need an adjuvant radiotherapy, provided there is mass in sunlight. But in high grade, you need radiotherapy. We have seen the evidence for that. But if you have an intermediate grade, then do we need to give radiation? This is a data, uh, again, National Cancer Database, included 700 patients, treated between 2000 and 2015. This is published in, uh, this is published in, again, American Journal of Photolabentology in 2019. And uh, it, it, sorry, it included patients who received, uh, this included positive Martin and negative Martin. You can see that those patients who received radiotherapy for positive surgical markings, the hazard ratio of mortality death was 0.34. Means in overall survival, there is a benefit if you keep adjunct radiotherapy for in positive margin with intermediate grade. But this was not there. Hazard ratio was one. That is means there is no benefit in, in patients who have negative surgical markings in early disease. This was intermediate grade carcinoma early disease. That is T1, T2 primary intermediate grade tumors were analyzed to know the impact of radiotherapy. And in positive margin patients, if you give radiotherapy for intermediate grade carcinoma, there is a survival benefit. And in patients who have negative margin, there is a survival, there is no survival benefit. And what about the local rail control? Because this was not analyzed in this particular chart. That is because that was not the aim of the uh, study, because only overall survival was analyzed. Now, coming to the adjuvant treatment, it is the main adjuvant treatment and the only adjuvant treatment is radiation. There is no role for chemotherapy in the adjuvant treatment of salivary gland. What dose you will give? The radiation to 60 grade or equivalent dose to the post operative gland. If you have a margin positive disease, then you can give 56 grade to that area where there is a margin positive. And you can give an IMR, you can use IMR to have a good. You can see the good mucosal. You can see that uh, uh, this mainly to spare the critical structures like brainstem, spinal cord, cochlea, mandible, neuropharynx. The dose is 60 gray or equivalent dose. 60 gray in therapy fraction is the answer. What are the indications for adjuvant radiotherapy in T3, T4 disease with supplant? Suppose if you have a, a T3 disease and is uh, even if it is FNS, it's low grade is tolerant. Then the counseling is surgery, total conservative pyridectomy plus adjunct radiotherapy. If it is high grade tumor, then the discussion of adjunct radiotherapy from the beginning before considering surgery. It's a plant. Any patient who has a node positive disease, margin positive or close margin, recurrent disease. Suppose I will give you an example. Suppose a patient had a T1, low grade mucapron one positive, margins negative. Then there's no role for adjunct treatment. The surgery is good enough. And if there is a recurrence, then you do a revision surgery. At that time, the adjuvant treatment is a plant treatment. It means in a recurrent disease, those patients who did not receive adjuvant radiation earlier should be considered for surgery followed by post-operative radiotherapy. Perineural invasion and lymphovascular invasion. These are independent uh, inclusion criteria for considering adjuvant radiotherapy. What is the role of chemotherapy along with radiation? This is again a data from National Cancer Database which is published in JAMA in 2016. That is JAMA Autolaryngology, head and neck surgery in 2016. Though if you add chemotherapy along with radiation, there is a trend towards having a negative impact. It is not statistically significant, but there's a negative trend towards a detrimental effect. Means a p-value is 0 0.08, and there is a negative impact. So it is, this is radiation alone. This is PRT. This is having a negative impact. So the, the role of adjuvant radiotherapy, so adjuvant chemotherapy along with radiation is not in fact, it is not, uh, that is data from uh, the National Cancer Database published in 2016. To, to evaluate the role of uh, uh, the adjuvant chemotherapy along with radiation, there is an ongoing clinical trial by the RTOG1008. Is it uh, major or minor salivary gland tumors, T3, T4 disease, intermediate or high-grade histology, node-positive or margin-positive patients are randomized to give 
and given radiotherapy, 60 gray to 66 gray, that is 66 gray in patients who are Martin positive, uh, randomized to radiotherapy or radiation plus concurrent weekly cisplatin 40 milligram. This is a phase two, phase three randomized trial, which is underway. We do not have any evidence. There is no published proof as of now. And uh, so there is so no proven role for a chemotherapy in the antigen. Because even in patients who have extra capsule extension or margin positive in salivary gland tumors, we cannot extrapolate the data for this commercial customer, that is the URPC 22931 or the RPG 9501, because this is only for commercial customer. You should not extrapolate the risk results to the salivary gland tumors. Salivary gland tumors are not that chemosynthetic. And in many of the salivary gland tumors have receptor positivity for the EGFR, the androgen receptors, HER2 receptors, but there is no proven data to keep any of this and target agents in the antigen sequence so far. The data is for the, the recurrent or metastatic disease, but there is no data to incorporate any of the target agents in the antigen Now, coming to the portals, okay, uh, so I will show you one of the patients which we have treated with two dimensional therapy. It is in superior, it is the psychomatic arch. So, inferior, it is the higher bone. And you need to treat the level two as well as one B. That will be part of the OLM. So that will come automatically included in the portal. So you have to take up the portal into the higher bone. So I'm talking about the two dimensional therapy. Anteriorly, the anterior edge of the uh, the the clenched masseter. Posteriorly, it is the the mastoid tip. So this is the mastoid tip. Then that is the period. So the lateral portals will be supersegmentic arch, inferiorly hyoid anterior masseter, clenched masseter, posteriorly it is the mastoid. Now, then, so this is a, this is the mastoid, this is the mastoid, posterior to posterior masseter, this is the, this is masseter, the anterior to the, and the border of the, and so this is the large border, okay, superior to the level of the psychoma, inferiorly to the level of the hyoid bone. So this is the, this is bone, actually this is a two-dimensional treatment, and the patient should be in the left lateral position. Uh, you can treat either by a photon alone or a photon electron uh, mix. This is a two dimensional therapy. So, this patient was treated with a two lateral beam, patient in this uh, uh, left lap in the lateral position. Then, two obliques this is the posterior oblique and this is the anterior oblique, two wedges for the uh, oblique fields. And you can use a bolus if the skin is involved or there was a, a rupture of the capsule or the tumor was very close to the, in the skin that is in the superficial area. These are the indications of the bolus. And uh, so this generally you need to treat the parotid bed and also part of the parapharyngeal space. So this is your skin. It covers the anterior edge, anterior to the clenched center. It's a distribution and this was a 2D planning. This is a 60 gray, this is a uh, 57 gray, that's a 95%. Distribution. Now, if, uh, you can use a uh, photon or you can use an electron or you can use a mix of this. Now, the recent advances in the uh, radiotherapy of salivary gland tumors, especially in the parotid, is the uh, COSTA, that is the results of a multi center randomized trial, cochlear sparing Indian stimulated radiotherapy, basis conventional radiotherapy in patients with parotid cancer. That is, data was uh, published in Europe in Journal of Cancer in 2018. By from the from mainly from the uh, Christopher from the arm Royal Master. And uh, what they have done, it was a multi-centric study, it included 22 centers in UK. And mainly, if you use an IMRT, can you spare the cochlea? So that was the main point of the study. And it was found that the data, the dose to the cochlea can be spared. Okay. Uh, now coming to the IMRT planning of the uh, salivary gland, but especially this parotid I will show. Next should be extended, the vortex to the carina. That should be the, which is the area which we need to have to do the imaging. Two to three mm slice. The CTVN1, that is CTVP1. CTV P1 includes the parotid bed plus areas at risk. That is cryptopharyngeal prones, 1B, 2B, and 2B nodes. And if the patient is having, so this area should receive CTVP1 should receive a 68-degree equivalent dose. So that includes the parotid thread, the retropharyngeal lump nodes, 1B, 2A, and 2B lymph nodes. I will show that. Then in CTV2, 
if the patient is having T3, T4, patient is having a Martin positive disease, sorry, in high grade histology, or in, if a patient is having any nodes are there, suppose a 1D node is positive, 2A node is positive, then you have to have a CTV. Other nodes also should be level 3, level 4, level 5, ipsilateral. So ipsilateral, so CTV P1 includes the parotid bed and parapharyngeal space. I will show that. Then retropharyngeal lymph nodes, 1B, 2A, and 2 b Level 3, level 4, and level 5 is optional in the so this is uh, the COSTAR guideline is at the level of the superior level. So that is at the level of the zygoma. Then they have defined at the level of the uh, at the level of the external auditory canal. Then below that at the level of the mastoid cells. Then at the at the angle of the mandible and also at the level of the pyoid. So uh, we will take one by one. Okay. Now at the level of the superior level, that is at the level of the zygoma. So this is the level you have to take at the level of the psychoma. So posterior part of the masseter, then in the, immediately you have to include into the infratemporal fossa, posteriorly the attachment of the pinna, laterally the skin. So that is the guideline. Says. So the posterior half of the masseter, it extends medially, it extends in infratemporal fossa, laterally the skin, posteriorly the posterior attachment of the pinna. That is at the level of the superior level. Now at the level of the external auditory canal, then you have to, uh, I hope you can uh, see that. Uh, can you see my mouse moving? Yes, sir, it's moving. Yeah. So the anterior limit is the anterior border of the masseter. So this is the masseter. This is the mandible. And you, this is the medial pterygoid muscle. This is the pterygoid plate. This is the parapharyngeal space. This is the retropharyngeal space. And this is the pin. Okay. So anteriorly and the anterior border of the masseter. Then Medially, it extends to you have to include the you need not include the medial pterygoid plate, but you have to include the lateral pterygoid plate. Then you have to include the parapharyngeal space. Here it is the retropharyngeal nodes. You need to cover the retro the preventable fascia. So this is the retropharyngeal lymph nodes and the fascia anterior to the skull base. And posteriorly, it is the the attachment of the pinna that is at the level of the external auditory canal. Now, uh, so I have a uh, I have a a two uh, diagrams. So you just give me this is suggestion. So this is any suggestion. You don't have to take anterior to the anterior border. Here you have to go a little more posterior to include the retro. So that this is the so this you have to take up to here, and uh, you you don't have to you have you don't have to go uh, the anterior to the anterior masseter, but you have to cover the pre vertebral uh, the fascia anterior to the skull base. So this is the area you need to cover the nodes. Then at the level of the external auditory canal, so again, anteriorly, the anterior border of the masseter, then the parapharyngeal space, you have to include the fascia anterior to the skull base, retropharyngeal nodes, and the posterior extent is at the level of the posterior extent of the mastoid muscle. So this is the mastoid cells. Posterior extent. On this side, left side, this should be up somewhere here. If it is in the right side, it is somewhere here. So that is the posterior extent of the mastoid airs. That is the at the level of the external auditory canal. Now, at the level of the angle of the mandible, in this cut onwards, then you have to bear in mind you have to consider the lymph nodes also. You have to cover the parotid bed, the parapharyngeal space, the, the, the fascia anterior to the vertebra. And also the posterior belly of posterior end of the Chinacloda mascot, that is the posterior extent of the level to level. You have to cover the, the parapharyngeal space, the parotid blood, as well as you have to cover the level to level. That is at the level of the angle of the mascot. And at the level of the, uh, the hyoid bone, that you have to take up to the coral edge of the hyoid bone superior, inferiorly. So you have to cover the uh, the posterior edge of the sternum. So superiorly, it is at the level of the psychomatic, psychomatic arch, inferiorly till the edge of the hyoid bone, and anteriorly, it is at the level of the anterior border of the masseter. Medially, you have to cover the parapharyngeal space. Posteriorly, you have to cover the fascia covering the, the, the cranial, the posterior fascia covering the uh, anterior to the skull base. And posteriorly, you have to come at the level of the attachment of the pinna 
at the level of the posterior abdomen of the femur. Then at the level of the mastoid, then you have to cover to the posterior edge of the abdomen, mastoid air cells. Then lower down at the level of the angle of the mastoid, the posterior end is at the level of the posterior edge of the stem of the mastoid. And when you have a patient is having a perineural indentation or patients who have adenoid cystic carcinoma, then generally you have to cover the stylomastoid foramen. And also you have to take the, you have to uh, contour till the basic. And when you need to have a bolus, skin involvement, suppose a patient is having a skin involvement at present, or pathologically if the skin is involved, this, and if the superficial margin is closed, or superficial margin is closed in that situation, or if you have history of a tumor spillage or capsule rupture during surgery, then you need to have a bolus. Otherwise, the bolus is need not be given. Now, coming to one of our patients to know the, the this is the superior cut. So you need to take up to the posterior of uh, the masseter. Laterally, this patient had a tumor spillage and the, the bolus is given and the posterior edge of the attachment of the posterior end of the attachment of the pinna. Then medially, it is taken up to the infratemporal fossa, slightly into that, laterally the skin. And uh, then you have contoured the, the, uh, the, the, the cochlea also on this side. And uh, then you have you have given this is your CTV. Then you have five margin. Initially, this was treated years back, and uh, uh, at that time we were using five mm as the CTV. So this was the final G CTV and PTV. Then you can see that this is the uh, five eight eight zero. That is saying ninety eight percent, and this is the ninety five percent. And you can see that you can you are easily able to spare the cochlea. We are using IMRT. Uh, in a parotid. Now, do you need to have an elective nodal irradiation? Okay, if a patient is having a node positive disease, then the involved nodal region should receive 60 equivalent dose. Below that, they, we know that the retropharyngeal nodes, 1B, 2A, and 2B should receive 60 grain. But if a patient is having, say, the node is positive, then the rest of the lymph node stations also should receive radiation, but to a prophylactic dose. But this can also be considered in patients who have very advanced disease like T3, T4 disease or a high-grade histology. Then in that situation, then you can consider a level 2, 3, uh, sorry, 3, 4, and 5, the elective radiation can be considered. Coming to the submandibular gland, uh, uh, submandibular gland post-operative radiotherapy, the indications are the same. When you look into the two-dimensional radiotherapy borders, you can see that superior border is at the level of the heart palate. You can use a bite block. So you can uh, you can spare the heart palate. Inferiorly, definitely, you have to go the, the caudal edge of the hyoid bone. Anteriorly, you have to cover the entire mandible anterior. That is the anterior to the mentum. Posteriorly, you have to the posterior. You can you have to cover the angle of the mandible. You have to cover the posteriorly the angle of the mandible. Anteriorly, this cover the entire mandible. Superiorly, you will be using a white block. So you will be sparing the heart palate. Inferiorly, you go below the portal of the thyroid bone. Then sublingual gland, this is more or less same. And again, it, you can use a white block, the one centimeter above the upper border of the tongue. And lower, it is the caudal edge of the thyroid bone. Anteriorly, again, the, the whole of the mandible. Posteriorly, it is the, the posterior aspect of the ascending mandibular band. This is the posterior level. Okay, that is the field bonus for the sublingual gland. And you need not treat a parallel pair if silica can be covered. The medium, it is a two centimeter past the midline. You don't have to treat the entire oral cap. Now, coming to the last part of my uh, the last slide. So, in T1 and T2, we know that clinically you should have a clear idea where you are dealing with a benign tumor. Clinical history is very important. Proper clinical examination and FNAC, you should have a proper interaction with the pathologist. And if it is a benign, you can get it with an arthroscopic region. And if it shows a malignancy, which is a malignancy, then you should be prepared to subject that patient for a surgery, which is equivalent to that of a malignant tumor. Then if in a malignant tumor, then you have the ideal investigation of choice is MRI. Then MRI is more useful to evaluate the deep lobe, the separated node, patient who have a paraphernalia space involvement, 
Then if the patient is having a perineural invasion, these are all better delineated by MR. The patient is having a mandible involvement or a temporal bone involvement, CT have an inch over the MRI in detecting the bone involvement. And after that, the patient should undergo primary surgery. In low-grade tumors, superficial, confined to superficial lobe, you can consider a superstatotonectomy, but the margin should be 0.5 centimeters. Okay. Then if you have FNAC shows a high-grade tumor, tumors involving the deep lobe or tumors having a arising the deep lobe, better to have a total conservative parotonectomy. Always you should try to preserve the patient. If not possible, try to sacrifice the branches. Then only you sacrifice the patient. Okay. Then in patients who have a T1 or a T2 disease, patient margin negative, low grade histology, then there is no need for any, or patient in these patients, there is no need for any adjuvant radiotherapy. So this patient can be followed up. In patients who have high grade histology, that is high grade histology is high grade mucopatal adenoid cystic castrum, patients who have undifferentiated histology, adeno castrum, adenosquamous castrum, salivary duct castrum, then in all this situation, this patient should undergo a, patient should have a surgery followed by histology. In, there is, the, in patients, what about the elective neck dissection? In patients who have high-grade histology or T3 or T4, patient may, consider, may be considered for an HCR, a elective neck dissection. But there is no need to do, a, there is the, the, the modified radical neck dissection, that's level one to level five clearance should be done in a patient who have a known positive test. If uh, in postoperative adjuvant treatment, then the ipsilateral level nodes means that is retropharyngeal nodes 1B, 2A, and 2B is included in the CTB T1. It should receive 60 gray in 30 fraction. Elective radiotherapy is maybe considered in patients who have T3, T4 disease or high grade histology. In node positive disease, if it is a 1B or level 2 is positive, whole neck should be treated. And the lower neck, the lower neck should be given elective dose to 50 to 54 degree for an inch. If a patient is having recurrent tumor, even if it is T1 or a T2, the patient should have a planned postoperative radiotherapy, surgery followed by postoperative radiation. There is no role for concurrent chemotherapy along with radiation. There is a RTOG1008 clinical trial is underway. And during surgery, at most, at most care to preserve the nerve during surgery, patient nerve. And in the radiotherapy, the coagulase pairing and treatment radiotherapy is the state of the art in 2020. Those who are interested, this, this is one of very good, uh, uh, the recommendation, this has come, the recent recommendation by the ASCO, this is published in, in, uh, in 2021. So this, you can go through that, this is freely available in the web in the JCO. This is the management of salivary gland ASCO guideline published in 2000. Coming to, if you have any queries, before I take the questions, if you have any queries or if you need my presentation PPT, you just send me an email, okay? Never WhatsApp me and send, sir, please send the PPT, okay? Because uh, uh, the, it is very easy to share. Uh, if you send me the, uh, your email account, I can share easily from my Google Drive. Otherwise, I have to download, then I have to share by uh, in WhatsApp. So you can send the uh, uh, email ID either by my email or in WhatsApp, then I'm, I'm happy to send my PPT. Uh, then I will take up the questions, okay? Uh, please tell with me, okay? We will take up the questions. Okay, I will sh stop sharing the screen. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Okay, I will take up the questions. Uh, in the chat box. Okay, uh, adenoid cystic astoma, radiotherapy is a must. Okay, very good. I will start from the lateral retro, ipsilateral lateral retropharyngeal nodes. Yes, ipsilateral, uh, Praveen, uh, la, ipsilateral uh, lateral, because medial retropharyngeal lymph nodes in 2013 update, the medial retropharyngeal lymph nodes is not existing as of now. So clinically relevant retropharyngeal node is only lateral retropharyngeal node. Okay, that is one. We, can, we have to include that. Flap, what uh, in uh, regarding the flap reconstruction, what should be the CTV into? Generally, you need not treat the flap. Okay, generally, you need, but you have to, that is below the flap. So you have to give really good radiation to that area. In, in situations, uh, generally, uh, that is required in patients who have a skin involvement previously. So adequate 
dose to that area is required. Most of the time, you may require a bolus also. And if it is a large tumor extending up to zygomatic heart, what should be the RCT we post on? Okay, so uh, you have to you have to always consider what was the previous pre uh, op pre op TT or MRI, and you have to look whether it is going up. Okay, so you have to include the pre op area also. If you are using IMRT, definitely you can reduce, even if the lesion is extending into the temporal region. You can always reduce the dose to the IMRT or by to the brain if you are using an IMRT. In case of squamous cell of subpandibular gland close to the concluding chain, very rare uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the submandibular gland close to sub in thus the coronary. In the submandibular squamous cell carcinoma, generally submandibular gland always better to irradiate the nodes also, nodal area, especially 1P that will come in the portal and also level 2. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are not sure whether a lower and a neck is included. Generally, I prefer to give radiation, although there is no uh, clear indication to say that a lower and a neck radiation should be given if it is not negative. But in a squamous cell custom, it's a little aggressive. Okay, you may consider a proper dose to the neck. Adenoid cystic carcinoma, yes, adenoid cystic carcinoma is a post of radiation. Is a must. How to include facial nerve path in adrenal system? So you have to trace up to the para, the parapharyngeal space, then you have to trace up to the piece of surface in case of uh, the, uh, in the adrenal system stalling. How much margin is considered close? Uh, we do not know, to be very honest with you, how much margin should be given as close? How much margin is considered as close? Okay, that's fine. Okay, if you have a, if it is, 0.1 or less, it is considered as margin positive. 0.1 to 0.5 is margin close. Uh, if it is a margin close alone in early disease, low grade histology, do you need to treat? To be very honest with you, I do not know that. Okay, very recent publication was there in, from the University of California. In patients who have margin close alone in early disease, a 23 year follow up showed there, are, there is no impact on with adjunct so if it is only margin is close, low grade histology, margin is negative, and margin is close, sorry, margin close in early disease, do we need to keep radiation? Uh, I'm not sure of it. Okay, uh, okay, it is a gray zone. What treatment you prefer for inoperable disease? Inoperable disease, you have to individualize. Okay, whether it is extending into skull base, uh, what about the, what, whether it is medically inoperable, always you can consider if it is for a, if, if you look into the ASCO guidelines, recent guidelines says that if it is medically inoperable, definitely you can consider that if you can that. In that situation, you have to counsel them for medically inoperable. Suppose a patient had a T3 disease and medically inoperable, and you can consider radical radiotherapy for that patient. And if a patient is having a very advanced disease, inoperable disease, like if a patient is having base of skull involvement, then generally do we need to treat the patient? This in this situation, you have to individualize them. Okay. Because uh, depending on the histology, uh, it's a slow growing tumor. Um, if it is E4, then you have to discuss with the patient. Then you decide on the uh, treatment. You can consider a radical radiotherapy or you can consider a palliative radiation to that if the patient is symptomatic. No role for chemotherapy. Again, it is specified in the guideline. No role for chemotherapy in a patient who is inoperable. Disease. There is no concurrent chemo radiation, it's radical radiotherapy. Polym in perineum invasion that I have discussed. In case of squamous cell carcinoma, submanual do we need? Okay. Uh, do you need to treat the buccal mucus condoring? No. If it is squamous cell carcinoma, submandibular salivary gland, there is no need to treat the buccal mucosa. But a part of the buccal mucosa will come as when you give the margins. Otherwise, you need not take it purposefully, provided you are sure that you are dealing with the salivary gland. Generally, there is a, there, you, you may not be able to know whether it is an MUO, whether it is a node. That's different. Otherwise, if it is a squamous, if salivary gland tumor, but generally you, the part of this buccal mucosa only will come, but there is no need to treat the part, whole of the buccal. Spend your awareness and spread. A case of subpandibular adenoid cystic carcinoma with the cavernous sinus mex, having symptoms of vision. The role for radiotherapy. In this situation, generally the treatment is palliation. You can consider palliative radiotherapy.
Yes. Um, okay. Shall we wind up? Okay. It's almost eight o'clock. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I suppose uh, there are no more questions. Just a few uh, questions from. Yeah, those two, uh, those for the same. Those okay. You, it, it, if it is, it, those is thirty gray in ten. You can consider palliative those. Uh, sir, adenoid cystic carcinomas, they are known to have distant metastasis. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, NCDB trial that you mentioned uh, that uh, they said not to give chemotherapy, but uh, to prevent the distant mets, what can be done in adenoid cystic carcinoma? Can we give another chemotherapy or not to give at all? There is no evidence to give chemotherapy uh, along with radiation, even in adenoid cystic carcinoma. Okay. So there is no, there is no radiation chemotherapy should not be given in the adjuvant setting. Okay, the percentage of patients developing adenoid cystic carcinoma with lung meds or patient with distant meds are small percentage. Okay, but we do not have any evidence to say that. Okay, there is no evidence to say that you can uh, give uh, the uh, uh, chemotherapy along with that. And if, okay, there was a question regarding the role of HER2 therapy. There was a paper which, uh, okay, I will show that. A small paper, including, that is a, about 19 patients. Okay, okay. In the adjuvant setting. Uh, there was a paper, the paper published in Oncologist in 2020. There's 95 patients with salivaric duct carcinomas. And uh, those 28 patients received chemo radiation. And nine patients of 19 completed trastuzumab concurrently along up to one year. And uh, those patients who received trastuzumab with in patients who in a salivary in, uh, with us uh, in a HER2 positive disease. And this, uh, the median disease-free survival, D, sorry, DFS, uh, DFS was 117 months. And not treated with nine months. It was, it was nine months. But it was a small study. Okay, in those patients, uh, 19 had, then only 19 patients had IHC confirmation. And nine out of 19 uh, received trastuzumab. That was given like a, along with then one year after birth, just, just like the adjuvant trastuzumab for early breast cancer. But we need more data to recommend that trastuzumab should be part of the adjuvant radiotherapy, adjuvant program in uh, patients who have. So although there are receptors, but we do not have any hardcore data to say that this can be given along with uh, radiation in the, in the adjuvant as well. Did, uh, okay. Yes. And uh, sir, the photon and electron combined therapy, so is the ratio fixed that uh, one is to four has to be used or is it? Uh, is uh, that depends on the depth you can use that. Okay. Uh, uh, so if you are using, uh, nowadays the uh, the people are using IMRT, the combination has come down. The use of combination has been done, come down because if you use an IMRT, definitely you can spare the cochlea. So uh, you can use uh, combinations like one is to four, like photon, photon electron combination. And uh, sir, like practically we don't do this, but uh, it is asked in exams, like the role of neutron therapy in okay. uh, this. Yeah, yeah. That is again, tumors. again, again, there was a paper which was published. Uh, it is based on the MRC data. That is uh, the number of patients were only 32 patients. The patients uh, who had MRC neutron trial uh, it was in that was uh, data was published in 1993. This is randomized between the photons and neutrons. The photon was the photon was 70 degree in 30, 70 degree over a span of 7.5 weeks. Neutrons uh, were given different schedules were given 22 gray and 12 fractions, 17.14 gray in 12 fractions. So this was randomized between photons and protons. The 32 patients in inoperable, unresectable, or recurrent salivary gland carcinoma. Then the, if you look into the local regional uh, tumor response or complete uh, response rate, it was better with patients with neutrons compared to photons. 
and in the neutrons the data was uh, it was percentage was 18% 85% in patients who responded but in photons it was only 33% so this was data with the rtog so as a collaboration between the rtog and the mrc neutron trial but the study was prematurely closed because of the poor patient approval okay sir uh, role of pmat in cochlear sparing that was that we were discussing Are there any other questions from anyone? Yes. Uh, so, sir, I suppose there are no more questions. Thank and, you very uh, much. So, yes, uh, would like to thank you so much, and uh, uh, I hope we have another class next week. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We will have the the MUO session next week. Okay. Thank so you so when, much, sir. When, and, the, uh, when the residents are back, okay, after the vacation. Yes. So uh, happy Navratri to everyone. And uh, thank you, sir, for giving your precious time. And uh, see you back soon. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.